own no matter what you're facing. Anybody got that testimony today? Hey, I want to take just a few minutes because I, I get it. This is family style worship, so we got the kids in the house. Kids, can I hear from you? Anybody, can I hear from you, kids? Come on. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, I want to take a few minutes today and, and just give a, a short talk uh, called The Best is Yet to Come. Called The Best is Yet to Come. Uh, we like to really lean into like the natural rhythms of the season. And for you guys, you know, it's, it's, it's Happy New Year's. It's New Year's Day. And so on New Year's Day, maybe you've been thinking about picking up some new ways or some new habits or some new things that you want to do. Uh, but I think some of us probably land more in the field that you want to drop some old ways. Amen. Anybody? Anybody's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to eat less this or I'm going to do less of that. Or some of you, I, you're on the more positive side. Who, who's on the more positive side? I'm going to pick up working out. I'm going to eat more vegetables. Some of you are like, thank goodness Christmas, Christmas tree cakes aren't in the gas stations anymore. Anybody there? Raise your hand. Be honest in church. Come on. Anybody there? I'm there. I'm just thankful they're not there anymore. All right. All right. Because the temptation, just get behind me, Satan, with those things. Um, no, we like to run in these natural rhythms, and that's where we're at uh, for the new year. And, uh, and we really, we really want to get a good first step of the year. And can we just, can we just, I'm just excited, like a full house. West Market is in the house today. I love it. It's a, a, it's an honor, seriously, it's an honor just to host. And I know it's, you know, trying to figure out what it looked like. We had no idea how crowded it would be. It would be like 20 people. I don't even know how many people are in the room. Uh, but I will say this. If you do not have a seat, there's three right here. There's one right over here. There's two right here next to my man Cooper. All right, there's a couple right here. So if, you're, if anyone's looking for a seat and you're right on the crack of a seat right now, there's some seats up front. The front is a force field. I don't know what it is. There'll be a thousand people in here. There'll be nobody in the front. All right. Like, like I always have this conversation with, with. It's always worship leaders. Like, it's like, are the seats too close to the front? You could put them on the stage. No one will sit there. All right. Like, they will always start in the second row. All right. So there's always seats in the front. Uh, no. Uh, I love the fact that uh, we get to come around this phrase. The best is yet to come. This phrase is normally used to give encouragement when times are really tough, but I'm really thankful, and I didn't see them today, but I could have missed them. Uh, they're from our West Market campus, the Yellen family. Y'all know, y'all know the Yellen family, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, Keith and Audrey Yellen. Uh, they, I think actually Audrey, I th believe, may, I don't know, Keith does woodworking, uh, but they made me this sign a while ago, and I put this sign right next to my door of my office. It says, it says, says the best is yet to come. That's what it says. And I'll tell you what, uh, something about this phrase is we can roll our eyes to this phrase at times, right? Because it kind of seems like buzzwords sometimes. It's like, it kind of seems like, well, that's just a way to say things when things are not going well. And, and so we just kind of say, just to, just to ease our tension and our stress, we just say, well, the best is yet to come. And, and so that, but that phrase means something different for me. And I hang it at that door because it's not just in the tough times, but I want to encourage you that even in the best of times, I truly believe this. Even in the best of times with Jesus, the best is still yet to come. I really do think that. Like even when things are going well, you're on the mountaintop, things are up and to the right. Things are, things are going well with your job and your family, uh, with your kids. Things are going well in your, uh, your bank account. Things are, you know, in the stock market, nobody, all right. But uh, things are going well. And, and, uh, but I truly believe with Jesus that the best is still yet to come. That the best is still actually in front of you when you're walking through life with him. And so it's not just about tough times, that this phrase doesn't just give us hope from a difficult past, but it also has the ability to encourage us in our steps forward. That as you and I strive with God, as you and I strive with God, as you and I try to figure out life with God, this phrase has the ability to help us remember that Jesus has a next step he's calling each of us to in the room, each of you. I don't care if, you, if you're not sure about the Jesus thing yet or if you've been following Christ for 45 years. There's a next step that God is calling you to. Every person in the room, we're streaming this, every person online, there's a next step that Jesus is calling each of us to. That he calls the people of God to live out a few things, to live out their best life in him. The, like, I'm just, can we just get around the idea that his way for us is best? I'm just going to operate from that foundation. All right. So when God says, well, this is what I want for your life, I'm just going to operate that I don't know as much as God and that his way is actually best for my life. 
and, and, and I believe that with all of my heart, and I believe that for your life too. And so there's a few things that I believe God calls all of us to. Every one of us. None of us are discounted from this. None of us are like, well, that's just not my personality. None of us are, uh, well, that's just what they do. That's what the pastors do. That's what the staff does. That's what the really religious people, which, by the way, you know, and, and, I, and I get why we use the word religion, but yeah, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you read in the scriptures, they were the religious people. Like, Jesus wants a relationship. He doesn't want you to have a religion. He wants you to... He wants to actually be friends with you. He wants to, God wants to be your heavenly father. He wants to be close to you. He doesn't want you just to do a bunch of religious practices. All right? And so there's a few things that he calls every single person to. And I'm going to read a passage pretty quickly uh, out of Acts 2. And maybe you've heard this before, but I'm going to give a quick context. Uh, this just came out of the fact that Jesus, I mean, he did everything that he did. He gave his life, right? Went to the cross, gave his life. Then he came out of the tomb, resurrected body. Then he gives his marching orders. Then he ascends up to heaven and goes, all right, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send the helper. I'm going to send him, and you're going to do greater things than I did is what he tells him. And then what happens in, in Acts 2 is uh, Peter starts to preach. Peter starts to preach, and thousands of people give their life to Christ. His message was this message of faith, hope, and love. It really was. And all they had learned up to this point were a, a lot of them were many uh, religious practices. And so when they all know the religion and all of a sudden they say, you know how you're, you're coming up short of all of the religious perfection? Guess what? Jesus died for you to have a relationship with you so you can have a relationship with God. And so you don't have to get it perfect. You, you can walk in the ways that God has for you. And we're going to talk about those ways here in just a second. But it's not about getting it perfect anymore. It's not about, it was never about that. But Jesus actually came and they all saw him. They all, they all witnessed it. The, many of them were talking about it. And so it made sense that thousands of people came to the cross that day and got baptized that day. Eternal life for thousands of people. And then what happened? What happened is what affects us every single day and every single week. After that, and it starts in Acts 2. This is what it says in Acts 2, starting in verse 42. It says they devoted themselves. This is the, this is the church right here. You ready? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. He keeps going, and he says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added, everyone say added, added. to their number daily those who were being saved. You get this snapshot glimpse of what the scattered church looks like. And all of a sudden, you start getting these little bodies of Christ that are forming, that are, that are devoting themselves to a few things. There are a few things. This is what you see in this. We're going to unpack these. That as the people of God, as we walk in them, we experience his best for our lives. And, come on, we get to witness the life change stories that he continues to bring out of this house. And when I say this house, I'm talking about all of Northridge Community Church. And I'm talking about uh, the capital C church out of the house of the people of God. He brings life change stories. Anybody got a life change story in here? Yeah, come on. You can, you can testify. That's what it is. You got a life change story. You're like, that's me. That's me. He found a broken 16-year-old that had no hope in front of him and saved him. That he was either going to end up in jail or dead. And he said, I got purpose for your life. And so he, he said, I, we get to continue to witness those things, those stories come out of this house. And so what things am I talking about that he calls every single one of us to? And we see him in this passage. And because we see him there, if you walked in, you saw him on the wall because we actually have him as core values of our church. They're the core values that we say, here's the things that God is calling every single person to. And we see it in the scriptures. The first one is this. And I'm going to go quick because I know what family worship style looks like, all right? Uh, but number one is this, we're connecting together. Connecting together. The passage says they devoted themselves to teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer, and enjoying the favor of all the people. They were devoted to living life together. Come on. I, I want to tell you, you were never meant to live alone. You could take whatever test you want to on Google. 
and it will tell you you're the most introverted person in the world. But can I just tell you, you may not need eight people, but you need two. You might need the one. And that's your people. That's your person. You were never meant to live alone. We were meant to live connected together. So maybe for you, the best that's yet to come is to step into connecting together. And for us, for us, it, it, just to help you and to help me because I will slide out of this real quick too. So I'm in this, I'm preaching to myself. Uh, we don't naturally go, well, I'm going to join a group, right? That's why a few times out of the year we go, hey, it's great to join a connect group. So we do that to help you. So we have connect groups. Both of the campuses have connect groups. If you're here because you were invited and you're like, what do you mean both campuses? 12 minutes that way, all right? 12 minutes that way, there's another building. It used to be a bowling alley. If you live closer to that one, go to that one. All right? If you don't have a faith family and a church to go to, go there. All right? There's a ton of people in this room you'll see there next week. Join a connect group. If you're like, well, that, that seems really intimidating, then find some people that love Jesus and will love you and will pray for you and you'll pray for them and you start investing in each other. We were not meant to do life alone. We connect together. The second thing is this, and actually I put two and three together, serving others and giving generously. I put these together because in life they can be very similar. They can be very similar. God's word says that, that they made sure in this passage, they made sure everyone had what they needed. And if someone didn't, they sold property and possessions to take care of people. I, can, I mean, Come on, if nothing speaks right into the heart of our culture of saying, I think they might have had this open hand in this thing figured out. It was like, do you have what you need? Do you have what you need? No, I don't have what I need. It's like, well, can I have some of yours? It's like, well, I don't really have enough either. But guess what? I've got, a, I've got a calf. And let me just give me a second. I'll go sell this calf over here. And then he comes back. Did you like that? That was funny, wasn't it? And then he comes back. He goes, now I have what you need. And they were open-handed to take care of the needs of people. And so maybe for you, the, the best that's yet to come is to begin serving others and giving generously. And we live this out by making our, our time and talent and our treasure available to serve and give in the house and out of the house. Because come on, I've, I've learned over the years that I don't just give to a church like we're, we're a part of so many partnerships in our community and all over the globe, all right, that I, I, I've learned that I give through the church. And the church just becomes this channel of this hope and this light that we get to be a part of. And so if you're trying to figure out, like, what does it look like to serve others and to give generously? Like, there's places to do that inside the house. And then I would tell you, don't just do it in the house. Do it out of the house. Do it in your neighborhood. Do it at your job. Do it in your classroom and on your teams. Do it in your family. Be someone that's open-handed with their time and their talent and their treasure wherever God lets you to, allows you to step foot in and see what happens around you. And the fourth thing is this, to multiply disciples. Th can I just tell you this is how the world changes? This is how the world changes. This is how eternally dead people find eternal life. By becoming a disciple of Christ. And you see that you see that God continued to add, someone's excited about it, add to their number daily. That doesn't bother me at all, by the way. I love the fact that we have all the kids in the house right now. I love it so much. I really do. I really do. It doesn't bother me at all. And I'll tell you this, and I'm just trying to help somebody. If it does bother you, I promise, I'm not, this is not a joke. If it does bother you, I want you to take a second and I want you to pray for that kid that's bothering you. And I want you to pray for their parents because they need it. It's not a joke. I'm not joking. Or I'm just telling you, God's going to do something in your heart. It says that in God's word that he added to their number daily those who are being saved. So as you're connecting, serving, giving, are you leaned in and talking to the people that God has put you in life with? Are you, are you actually leaned in and talking with the people that are struggling about faith, about their best that is yet to come in their lives? Are you asking questions about other people's lives and seeking opportunities to play a part in multiplying the kingdom of God on earth? So if not, maybe your best that's yet to come is asking God to help you become someone that joins him in making disciples where you live, work, and play. Can I tell you something? That is not just the job of the pastor. 
It's not. You have been put in the places you've been placed to intersect with the people that God has placed you with. Can I tell you something? They may never hear a message preached, and maybe they don't need to hear a message preached for the next 10 or 20 years. But maybe the only light, hope, and message they get is because you showed up to work that day. Think about that. When you start thinking about, like, am I just showing up to work bitter every day? Think about that when, when you're like, am I just showing up at home and I'm just spent? But I get, I, can I tell you, your kids are an opportunity to, to, for discipleship. So if you just show up and you're spent and you just throw everything back and you're just like, whatever, I'm done. That you've been placed there on purpose, for a purpose, to intersect with the people that God has put you around. To get on board with him to begin making disciples where you live, work, and play. We're so grateful for what God has done through our house over the last 14 years. But we believe that as we step into God's best for our lives, as individuals, as we step into God's best for our lives, that our church will experience that the best really is yet to come. So my question for you is this, and like I said, a short message today. My question is this, what's your next step? What's your next step? Because I guarantee you, it's probably 100%. None of us are four out of four. None of us are like, well, I've, re I've reached the, the highest level. All four of those. Pretty good. Some of you, your next step is you're like, I, I do need to connect with some people that have faith. Some people that, are, that love Jesus and they'll care about me and they'll care about my family. I almost start to care about them. And there's going to be this connection piece that I've been missing for a while. Some of you, some of you, you thought what you've been working for and what you've been putting in your bank account, you thought this whole time it was yours. You thought this whole time it was yours. Can I just tell you that everything on planet Earth is God's and we get to manage it? We get to steward it? We, we, get to, we, we get to honor him and glorify him with it. So that means your energy, your time, and that means your treasure. Nobody wants to hear that message. Right? I'm just so glad if you look in the scriptures, as a whole, you can do a whole sermon or a whole series on this. But if you look in the scriptures, if I say, well, God, money, all my money is God's, I'm just glad that he, he just goes, I just want 10% of it. Because if you think of it that way and you kind of put your foot down and go, yeah, I believe what the scriptures say about everything that on earth is his, I'm, I'm, you know, he could be like, no, I want 90% of it. You keep 10. He could say that. And, you'd st and he'd still be right. Your time, your energy, when it comes to serving other people. All that, all that's his. And so this idea, maybe your best, the best that's yet to come for you for this new year is to say, I'm going to make some calendar space. Because I don't have it. That's me. That's me. I, I, I tell Springfield people all the time, I'm, I'm preaching myself, all right? All right, I'm up here and I'm going, I need y'all preach it with me. Because I'm up here just, I'm up here going, this is me in this season. I need to make some calendar space. I need to make some white space. Anybody? Amen. Unless you don't have a white calendar. I need to make some calendar space so there's some margin in there. That way my little bit of time doesn't get all eked out. And, now, and all of a sudden I look back at the course of the year and I go, I didn't have any margin where I could really follow the Holy Spirit where he wanted me to go. So all I did was follow my plans. And my plans come up short every time in comparison to God's plan for my life. Maybe your best is getting on board with God when it comes to multiplying disciples. When it comes to, you've got a few people in your life, and you're going, man, I'm intimidated. Well, guess what? If, that, if that's you, I would say any of these steps. Get that connection card and go, this is my next step. I need help. Get that connection card. There's a basket as you leave here. Get that connection card on the seat back in front of you. Write down, this is my next step, and I need help with it, and put it in that basket, and we will help you with it. I promise. If you're like, I want to know how to have those conversations with people, we want to help you with it. Because we believe that we don't just gather, we're also scattered. We're not just the church in one place, we're the church in every place. And so maybe that's your next step and the best that's yet to come for you. So what is your next step? 100% of people, this is all of us on board with going, what is my next step? And how are you going to let God work through you this year? Because he wants to.
He wants to. And I promise you this. If you're waiting just to grow before he begins working through you, then we've got it backwards. Because once you start letting, the, letting him work through you, you're going to have to dive into this even more. You're going to have to. And all of a sudden, you see God working and not just you working. And then a few months down the road, you see, man, I just feel like God's doing something in my life. And all of a sudden, uh, all of a, someone just told me, I think Jim told me that I've been using that word, those words a lot, all of a sudden. All of a sudden, you go, man, that was one of the most fruitful years of growth that I've ever experienced. And all I did was say yes. All I did was take a next step in four areas of my life that we see in God's word. And I saw God do incredible things, and he begins to get the glory for your life. So you answer the question, what is your next step? Let me pray for you. God, as we lift up your name today, as we worship you, I pray that it is that our hearts are, have this position and this posture that it's an audience of one. I love having a, 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 a packed room, but can we not forget that we are worship, worshiping Jesus on the throne? That you are our king, and we're so grateful that even if things go sideways for us, that does not dethrone you. I'm thankful for every kid in this space. I'm thankful for every person, every adult in this space. I'm thankful for every person listening online. But God, we need the Holy Spirit to push us forward, to give us a faith and a courage that comes from heaven that we can step into and go, yeah, that is my next step. And that's actually the best that is yet to come for my life because, God, your way is best. And I'm going to step into that. There's some people in here right now that, They've already dismissed some of the things we just read about. I think Saul probably dismissed the idea that he would be one of the leading church planters in all of history. But I just know with you, all things are possible. With you, there's nothing that's impossible. And so there's people in this space and listening right now that they would say, I'll never join a connect group. I'll never begin to serve and give. I'll never, I, you know, that's for the, that whole multiplying disciples, making disciples. That's someone else's thing that you want to work. You want to come into their lives right now and say, no, no, no. Maybe 2023 is the year that everything turned around. And you began to get glory for their lives. God, we love you, but it pales in comparison of how much you loved us and what you did on the cross through your son. Jesus, thank you. We love you and pray this in your name. Amen.